Okay, I think my microphone's turned on. Can you hear me just fine? Okay. It's good to be here again this morning. Last Sunday we went through uh, Genesis chapter 6 and 7, verse by verse. And uh, I said I'd come back and we'd talk about what, what happened, the mechanics of the flood. I also said I'd bring a picture so we could appreciate the size of the ark because we talked about it a little bit. So here you are, there's a picture. 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, 51 feet high at the gunwale, halfway between the front and the back. And I know some of you are wondering, what's the front and what's the back? And uh, let me see if I can get there. The back is on your right. I mean, the, the front is on your right. The back of the boat is on your left. So the bow and the stern. Because the ark didn't have power, and the wind would take it across the ocean perpendicular to the waves, it needed a, a high portion on one end to catch the wind. So that's the bow. And that's the size of the ark. And now we'll get on to Noah's catastrophic flood or the Genesis flood. And we're gonna begin talking about Noah's flood. We already answered the question, how big was the ark? Because that's always the first question when anybody brings up the flood. The first thing anybody says is how big was the ark? How could it carry all the animals? And I had a number up there, 6,744 animals, plus or minus 1,000 or two. There was plenty of room on the ark. And then we move on to why use a worldwide flood? I'm gonna pause a moment here to get organized. And we want to use a worldwide flood. God wanted to use a worldwide flood, as we mentioned last week. The flood is a powerful message of judgment and salvation. And there's a lot of evidence of the flood left over. So he provided grace to Noah and he provided grace to us. And what we see today in the geology of the world is the wreckage of the flood. The flood has the explanatory power required so we can appreciate the geology we have today. I just want to mention a couple of things here. We have sediments on top of continents. Only a worldwide flood could do that. We have the Himalaya mountains that were pushed up by a collision of the continents. We have marine fossils high up on mountains. We have a cold ocean floor. We find cold ocean floor slabs inside the earth. That could only happen as a result of the worldwide flood, and you'll see how that happened. And there are a thing called uh, basalt I mean, we had lava pouring out of the earth. In, in India, there's a place that's, I think, 6,000 square miles of lava <clears throat> poured out on the surface of the earth. Catastrophic things like that. It takes a worldwide flood. So God left a lot of reminders around for us. And was the Genesis flood through history? Well, it is because the Bible is through history. But as we look at the catastrophic mechanisms that tore apart the pre-flood world, you will begin to understand the flood makes sense. A worldwide flood makes sense of what we see today. <clears throat> so we'll move on here. And there's a nice quote that I like. It comes out of a book written in 2014. And did you have your hand up, Brian? Okay. If you do have a question, throw your hand up. I might have an answer. Uh, but anyway, geologists, it, it just tells us that geologists study the results of the most destructive forces unleashed upon the earth. Theologians study the causes. The Hebrew text links the two. The Hebrew text being what we see today is the Old Testament. It delineates the first, that is the destructive forces, 
We're talking about the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven and everything else that went on during the worldwide flood. And it specifies the second, the cause, Almighty God. The flood event provides an overarching scheme or model the fossil bearing, uh, fossil bearing rock layers covering 75% of the Earth's land surface are stacked in catalog sequences. They've been studied a lot. They've been matched from region to region, across continents and between continents. It's this reality that provides the record of the outcome of the flood. That's what geologists are studying, the result of the flood, although they attribute it to different causes. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Thomas Christian. Uh, didn't they find the flood, uh, didn't they find the ark? No. The ark has not been found. That's the second most popular question. Yeah, that's the second most popular question. Yeah, that's the second most popular question. That's the second most popular question. It has not been found. But you can see the Noah's Ark. You can see Noah's Ark. It's been rebuilt it's down in Williamstown, Kentucky. And it looks like that ark that was up on the first slide. Thank you. Um, this slide can be summarized up, summarized by saying that some people believe that nothing explains geology better than the flood. And that's true. Now we're looking at what's called a mega sequence. And I'm preparing you somewhat today with terms and how things happen for a 23 minute video next Sunday that's going to put all this together. And it's a pr pretty neat video. But this is the Salk mega sequence. This is the first mega sequence that went down during the flood. And you can see the yellow is all sandstone, the blue is limestone, and the red is shale. But the thing to notice is the extent, how much of the continent it covers. And it covers not only here, we can find the uh, sandstone layer. It's the peat sandstone. You can find it on the bottom of the Grand Canyon. It's the first layer on top of the igneous rock at the bottom. You can also find it in southern Jordan, the city of Petra, the ancient city of Petra that you read about was carved out of this sandstone. So it's worldwide. You find it on all continents. All these mega sequences have been verified by core samples, 1800 core samples across the world. So we know the mega sequences are all over. And it takes more than a regional flood or a local flood to do that. So be encouraged. The flood, the flood happened. It's a, a wonderful thing that it did. Flood mechanisms. How did the flood happen? What are the fountains of the great deep? What are the windows of heaven? What is the sequence of events? And what is the best explanation? Catastrophic plate tectonics, CPT for short, is the best explanation. And now we'll get into uh, catastrophic plate tectonics because it explains the forces that God orchestrated to direct and accomplish his intended destruction. It reminds me of the verse about the goodness and severity of the Lord. And we talked a little bit about that last week, the goodness and severity of the Lord. He was doing justice to those who had sinned and he was providing grace to those who were seeking him. And that still applies today. Let's start out with the flood water depth. And we mentioned it last week, but I promised I'd show you a chart. And the flood starts and the water in the first 40 days goes up to the Maximum cuts across to 150 days and begins to assuage. And that is the best understanding of how the water level worked because of the amount of destruction that we see 
and all that was accomplished during the flood, the movement of the continents and so on. The flood was a, uh, a moving around of the pieces of the continents. I don't know how many of you have heard of this before, but it, when the Lord gathered the seas into one place, by inference, we know that the land was in the other place. We had originally one continent. Both standard geology and creation geology, uh, everybody believes it. Every geology, every geologist out there believes that we started out as one continent that broke up into the continents we see today. The continent, the original continent here is called Rodinia. God didn't have a name for it. It was just Earth. <clears throat> and Rodinia broke up and kind of reassembled early in the flood, just parts cracked and moved around, became Pangaea, and then later in the flood they started to spread apart in what's called continental sprint, <coughs> moving to where we see the continents today. Um, Genesis 1-9, God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. So that's where we get the idea of one continent. <clears throat> Plate tectonics. I'm going to do a little background here so you have a better understanding of cat catastrophic plate tectonics. Tectonics is that aspect of geology focused on structural change in the Earth's crust, the land that we walk on, which is not very thick compared to the 8,000 mile diameter of the Earth. The crust is about 25 miles on average. There are 12 major tectonic plates in the Earth's crust. Today, we see this. And this complicated looking slide, don't look at it too hard, just know that there are plates, the arrows show the plate movements, and the present day tectonic plates move five to six inches a year. They're still moving. Standard plate theory says movement has always been slow, therefore required millions of years. There, and catastrophic plate theory says movement during the flood was rapid, and there is good evidence that plates once moved rapidly with great force because we have geological formations that couldn't otherwise be produced. During the flood, the plates moved 3.8 to 7.8 miles per hour. Doesn't seem very fast for an automobile, but for a continental plate, that's sprinting. And CPT says the long ages are not required for present tectonic plate configurations within the young earth time frame of 6,000 years. So, so there's an explanation for how we got to where we are today in a young earth. This idea of continental plate movement is not new gentleman named Antonio Snyder Pellegrini in 1858 came up with the idea, said the essential elements of the CPT model were first proposed back then, suggesting that a great continent had broken apart rapidly during Noah's flood. He actually published a book. He wanted to get it published in English, but he couldn't find any publishers, so he had to publish it in French. And 1858 was kind of a bad year. His ideas were not well received because they were connected to Noah's flood. In the middle of the 1800s, biblical explanations for things were going down the drain. Geologists were preferring long ages. A lot of thinking were running against Noah's flood and biblical explanations. Darwin's popularity was rapidly rising. And you know that Darwin's book was published in 1859 in English. So that, that was a, a big headwind. Another thing you might be aware of is that Gregor Mendel, he's a father of modern genetics, and Antonio Snyder Pellegrini, they were both contemporaries of Darwin 
but they were not well received, not well published, not well received. And I believe if either one of them had been received, it would have put, a, put, put an end to the idea of evolution and long ages. Um, Mendel's ideas especially are counter to Darwin's ideas. There is a great deal of evidence that the continents were once together. You look at North America, South America, Europe, and Africa, and you can see continental rock strata that share a similar order, and their structure, and their chemical composition. So it's understood that the continents were once together and have moved apart. <clears throat> As we get a little more technical, are you, are you holding up? You doing okay? Are you following me? Okay. All right. The inner earth here, this cutaway, the red section is the mantle. I'll start on the outside there. We have the crust going around the mantle. The land crust, about 25 miles thick on average, is an onion skin, basically. It's, it's compared to the whole planet, it's nothing. It's easy to fracture, so to speak. 8,000 miles diameter, 4,000 mile radius. The red part's 1,800 miles deep. The, uh, the continents ride on the tectonic plates that I was pointing out earlier. The plates float on the outer layer of the mantle. The Earth's crust is like an onion skin. It's very thin versus the whole onion. The continental crust, I said, was 25 miles on average. Under the Himalayas, of course, it's a lot thicker. It's just like when you stack things up in water, you want to get a bunch of wood to float. There's going to be a bunch under the water and a bunch above the water. The ocean floor crust thickness Average is only five miles, but it has a greater density than the uh, crust. The crust density is like aluminum, and the ocean floor density is about 20% greater. And therefore, it's also heavier than the mantle material beneath it, which is, will become important later on. <clears throat> and I want to mention magma. The magma comes up from that red area, the mantle, and when it reaches a surface out of a volcano or a crack in the ground, then we call it lava. Same thing. The magma comes up from the mantle. Magma is 1,300, 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit today. During the flood, it was probably greater because there were, there was some accelerated uh, radioactive decay going on inside the earth, and that generates heat. Temperature inside the earth. We look at the core uh, at the, not, that 9,000 degree figure you see there, that's at the outer core. You go up to the bottom of the mantle where it meets the outer core, 7,200 degrees. As a reference point, aluminum melts at 1,200 degrees. So we're talking hot. And I just, just so you know, when I start talking temperatures later, you know where the heat comes from. Um, back to a big picture chart showing rhodinium in a transition to today's continental positions. <clears throat> what did God use to trigger the fracturing of the continental crust? That's often asked. Well, it could be pressure from within, increasing uh, the pressure on the crust, the earth kind of expanding due to accelerated nuclear decay and heat within, the, down in the mantle and the core, or it could be an astral object, an object from space passing close to the Earth and temporarily distorting its shape. Or it could be an impact of, such as the big crater you find down in the Gulf of Mexico. 
or it could be the weight of the basaltic crust in the ocean becoming too much for the mantle to support. That old cold ocean floor is heavier than the mantle under it. <clears throat> and gravity could pull it down. More than likely, and there's been a lot of speculation, you can find books on this, it's a combination of those things going on that brought about the catastrophic processes. <clears throat> Now the catastrophic processes that happened during the flood are listed here. At the end of seven days, when God closed the door on the ark, five huge geological processes began simultaneously. Simultaneously is important. To and that's to accomplish a complete reworking of the surface of the earth, the atmosphere, the climate, and the occupants. <clears throat> and we'll take those processes one at a time. Okay, you, ha you have them all in your mind? The fracturing of the surface, the cold ocean floor is going to sink, the magmas are going to begin to circulate, and then there's going to be supersonic steam geysers sending ocean water into the atmosphere, and then there's going to be magma spreading out on the ocean floor, replacing the old ocean floor. Okay, hang on to that. Number one, the Earth's crust fractures. Think of Humpty Dumpty or creating your own jigsaw puzzle. The ocean floor and the continental crust split, both of them. They're all fracturing on land and in the ocean. Thousands of miles of mid-ocean floor split open. Thousands of miles, 40,000 miles of ocean floor split open and began to spread apart, allowing hot magma to contact ocean water. The one single continent begins to break apart. It doesn't take off and spread rapidly. It shifts shape from Rodinia to Pangaea at the beginning. The key word here is instability. The sediments are building up on the continent. The entire surface of the earth began shaking and moving as the earth's crust fractured into large pieces. There were thousands of earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, and lava flows. <clears throat> it was a, not a good place to be unless you were in the ark. Number two process, subduction of the old ocean floor. The original ocean floor is cold, dense, and heavy and separates from the edge of the continent. That's part of the cracking process <clears throat> and begins to descend into the mantle. This process, by the way, is called subduction. That's not a bad term. It's not immoral. It's not illegal. It's a geological term. Okay, subduction. The continental crust is overall of lighter material than the ocean floor and therefore floats or rides higher on the mantle than the ocean floor. So the, in standard geology, the continents are seen as sinking into the mantle and the ocean coming up on top of the continent and then the continent rises again and then it sinks again. This happens seven or eight times, but the continents are too light to sink into the mantle. That's the point here. Continents don't sink. So we have to find some way to bring sediments up onto the continents. And that's what the catastrophic plate tectonics model does. <clears throat> okay, they float higher on the mantle than the, ocean, than the ocean floor, which is a colder, more dense, heavy basalt material. The heavy ocean floor has the inherent instability inherent instability in that it's heavier than the mantle material and given the right conditions it will sink deep into the hot less dense mantle magma. It's still going on today but at a slow rate. Think of a steel needle supported by surface tension on top of water and when disturbed it will sink. In addition the chemical makeup of the old ocean floor causes it to accelerate into a runaway subduction condition 
pulling old ocean floor into the mantle. Gravity is, a, is what's operating. The old ocean floor is sinking into the mantle, but it, it because of its chemical composition, and this has been tested in a lab, as it heats up, it's kind of self-lubricating. It's like trying to hang on to a big stick of butter. Pretty tough to do. You take it out of the freezer and hang on to it, it's gonna slide right out of your hand and hit the floor. And so that accelerating subduction is called runaway subduction. So the, the process begins and then it speeds up. <clears throat> Plate subduction is still going on today but at a much lower rate of five to six inches a year. Now this is uh, a familiar area to some folks in the room. Uh, Portland, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier, and so on. But we have the, even today, the ocean floor is, is going down under the continental plate here. Continental plate is lighter. And the water coming off the uh, subducting plate gets into the magma, steam powers it upward, and it rises up, and then we have volcanoes as the magma gets up to the surface. <clears throat> so what evidence do we have for the original ocean floor descending into the mantle? That seems like a pretty wild claim. Well, we have kind of a sonogram of the Earth. In, in, I think this is extra cool. <clears throat> 1994, before seismic tomography, how we could look inside the Earth, before seismic tomography of the Earth was sufficiently refined, before we had enough computer power, probably, creation scientists, based upon the catastrophic plate tectonics model, predicted that Earth tomography would eventually eventually disclosed the existence of cold slabs of original ocean floor within the mantle. That's a bold prediction. If you don't find it, you look scientifically stupid. But there are many creationist scientist predictions that have done well, much better than <clears throat> other predictions. In 1997, I'll digress for a second. The magnetic fields in the outer planets, that was correctly predicted by creation scientists. And that's another thing I think is cool. They, they nailed it, the strength of the magnetic field. So when we sent satellites out there and started exploring the, our uh, planets around us, they, they had the correct prediction. In 1997, the discovery of actual slabs of lower temperature material in the Earth's mantle beneath subduction zones around the Pacific Ocean Basin provided strong support for the CPT model. In that video next week, we'll talk a little bit about that area. <clears throat> Okay, that was uh, what, fracturing and subducting, now magma circulation, number three, simultaneous process. Cold dense rock sinking and hot light molten rock rising in the 1800 mile thick mantle lying between the crust and the core of the earth. As cold ocean floor descends into the mantle, hot magma is displaced and rises establishing, establishing a conveyor belt to replace the old ocean floor. And by the way, the old, uh, the ocean floor is young. I mean, secular scientists, creation scientists, everybody knows the ocean floor is young and doesn't have a whole lot of sediment on it. If it was millions of years old, it should be loaded with sediment. It isn't. Okay, it's been replaced recently. Gravity pulls the old ocean floor into the mantle and the process slows nearly to a stop when all the old, cold, dense ocean floor has subducted. So, again, we're going over the process and over the process and I apologize if you think I'm repeating, but I, I do want you to understand <clears throat> what CPT is. 
Number four, supersonic steam jets erupt. Simultaneous <coughs> process number four. Violent supersonic steam jets erupt mid-ocean. Or you could say fountains of the great deep supply water to the windows of heaven. If you can picture 40,000 miles, it's probably more like 45,000 miles, with what we have today in the middle of the ocean, we have 45,000 miles of rifting in the ocean floor, the mid-Atlantic ridge and, and things like that. Thousands upon thousands of miles. <clears throat> and those were open when that fracturing occurred when the door was closed on the ark. Okay. 40,000 miles of globe encircling cracks in the ocean floor rapidly pouring out 5,000 degree Fahrenheit magma coming in contact with deep ocean water, which of course is at high pressure. Then you can imagine what an explosive combination that would be. 5,000 degrees ocean water, and then what we wind up with is <clears throat> the supersonic, it's an explosion really, it's, it's not just steam like you say coming, it's an explosion. 5,000 degree temperature and water immediately explode. And so it's the pressure of the deep ocean water is forcing it inward, it has no place to go but up, and as it goes up, it's also pulling ocean water with it, not just steam, but it's what's called entrailing ocean water and just ejecting it into the atmosphere. And that is a very powerful process. It is a force of superheated steam <clears throat> that took the top off Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1980 and also did that volcano recently down in uh, New Zealand, White Island. It, that was another one. But when, when a volcano uh, can't get rid of the steam and it builds up and builds up, then you get the explosion kind of volcano instead of the kind where it just kind of dribbles out of the top and the, and the mountain builds. But you can't blow the top off a mountain without that steam power. And 1980, May 18, 1980, 1,300 feet disappeared from the top of Mount St. Helens. Very impressive uh, process, and it's just steam. And I mean, we know now it's very powerful. But back to this chart, <clears throat> we can talk about the, the new hot raised ocean floor. As the old ocean floor goes into the mantle, the new ocean floor comes in. And I don't want to use the term fluffy, but it's thicker and lighter, okay? The rising magma spreads out rapidly, forms a new raised ocean floor. The new raised floor is a key part of the CPT model. It wasn't just tsunamis, tides, and rain that put the continents underwater. The hot new ocean floor displaced at least, at least 3,500 feet of ocean water, effectively raising the sea level 3,500 feet. New hot material is temporarily less dense. It's thicker than the old uh, ocean floor. In the last half of the flood, <clears throat> You get after 150 days there, the floor is cooling and sinking. By that time, it's estimated the floor is pretty well in place at the 150-day point, looking at sequence of events. And the floor begins to sink, allowing water to flow off the continents back into the oceans. That's the term used in the Bible I read, says, that, and, it, and the waters began to assuage. The raised ocean floor explains why we find thousands of feet of sedimentary rock on top of the continents and why we don't find thick sediments on the ocean floor, which indicates they are new. I got ahead of myself a while back. <clears throat> From top to bottom in the sediment layers on the continents, we find a mixture of marine and terrestrial fossils. And this tells us the oceans had to rise up over the continents because we know the continents can't sink. They're lighter. They float like a cork. The sediments we would expect to find 
in the ocean were dumped up on the land during the flood and the ocean was refloored. That cannot happen using slow and gradual processes. The CPT model makes more sense of what we observe. Continents are not dense enough to sink into the mantle and the ocean had to flood onto the continents. I want to, right in this area, when the floor goes under the continent, all the old sediments on the ocean floor, how many times has the earth been completely flooded worldwide? Twice. Twice. Creation. And then on Genesis 1 9, he said, But the seas be gathered into one place, and the land come forth. That was, that generated a lot of sediment. So there were sediments on the ocean floor when they started. They're scraped off here at the edge of the continent, and then the tsunamis, two tides a day, the moon, you know, tides were, there's nothing to obstruct tides when the earth is covered with water. The tides were enormous, and they just drove things up on the continents. It's, a, it's an amazing process when you really get into it. Uh, I'll move on here <clears throat> as a, a quick review. The ocean floor and the land crust fractured. The, the original cold ocean floor sank. The magma circulation began and continued until the ocean floor was replaced. The violent supersonic steam geysers, geysers erupted and gave us the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven. And we wound up with the new ocean floor. The CPT process outcomes studied by geology. The Earth's crustal plates moved rapidly, 3.8 to 7.8 miles per hour, continental sprint, massive tsunamis, currents, and tides, and the rising sea level covered the continents. Marine life and sediments were deposited up on the land. I'm repeating a little bit. Continuous deposition of sedimentary rock layers. This continuous deposition, it's, it's like a drive-by concrete truck, a very big one. This depositing of the sediments just went on continuously and layer after layer after layer. And you can see that in the Grand Canyon. The layers are not separated. Um, <clears throat> Massive volcanic eruptions added rock and ash layers, which we find in the mega sequences, the six mega sequences full of fossils. The fossil record is a sequential destruction and burial of habitat. Okay, it is from marine things close to the ocean to things on higher land. And mountain ranges were formed rapidly. The destruction and burial gradient, the most important thing in the lower right corner, just I'll just read that. The geologic record shows the sequence and destruction, sequence of destruction and burial of environments and ecosystems. It is not a timeline of life forms development. It's misconstrued as a timeline of life form development, but it's just where things were carried and buried. Fossils are found where they are carried and buried, not where they lived. And that video next week will talk very well to that issue. You'll see why we have dinosaur graveyards and fossil, you know, massive fossil graveyards that could only come from this type of worldwide destruction, these world size processes. Very, uh, very impressive number of fossils we have. <clears throat> Collision mountains, uh, thrust mountains, mountains that weren't formed by volcanic activity require uh, fast movement of the continental plates. It's like two automobiles hitting at highway speed. They're gonna, they're gonna have a large crash and they're gonna move up high. The Himalayas, we have, uh, you know, they're over five miles high, 14 peaks over five miles, and then you have Everest that goes up to 29,000 feet, nearly six miles. So 
CPT required to form that kind of thing. <clears throat> and again, we'll go back to this. CPT uh, was required for the rapid formation. The mountains are young, by the way. And uh, they had to form rapidly recently. And so I won't go back into the, the water and the mantle causing steam, but this process continues today at a much slower rate as long as, the, and the plates are moving at a much slower rate. <clears throat> so we've looked at how the flood happened, the fountains of the great deep, the windows of heaven, the sequence of events. I hope you have a, a little better grip on what happened and how it happened. And the best explanation out there, I believe, is the CPT. And these are my references, a couple of uh, graduate level geology books by Dr. Andrew Snelling, plus uh, the uh, uber graduate book, The Bible. And that's the main thing. We're all, the most important thing is truth. And <clears throat> we don't want geology and people who speak from their own experiences to try and outclass our Lord and Savior. We need to stick with the truth and find the right explanations. And I want to encourage everyone to, uh, if you go online, go to a good website like AnswersInGenesis.org, Creation.com, and ICR.org. You'll increase your understanding and wisdom. Read the Bible, visit Christian websites. Yes. Bruce. I don't want to take up too much time. I, I actually have been looking at some of that stuff, but um, that was an excellent review, by the way. I want to give you credit for that. Thank I you. Have a, I have kind of a crazy theory about this because the one thing you didn't talk about was that the Earth's core is molten metal and it actually spins. It imparts the spin to the magma's flow. You guys ever heard of the hand of God? I think God could actually reach out, grab that core, and stop it from spinning. If you're moving something really fast and you stop it, if the, sorry, the old waiter days are coming back, but if you literally it. stop suddenly, stuff goes flying off your tray. If there are. Spinning, yeah. If you did all that, then all that stuff that Bob just talked about would happen. But that's my theory. If I said it anywhere else, I'd probably get laughed at, so I'm going to say it in front of you guys and get off my chest. But now, there, there are a lot of, of uh, there's a lot of speculation out of there, out there, and, and we have to use our you know, common sense, Hebrews 3, 4, you know, God, God said every building has a builder, but God is a builder of all things. Thank you very much.